Chaos exists to improve health outcomes for BC, Canada, and the world. Learn more at chaos.ubc.ca. So, hello everyone. Um, I'm just absolutely delighted to be here on behalf of the Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research. My name is Chinetta Jones. I'm Vice President Research at the Michael Smith Foundation. Um, I want to thank, first of all, the organizers for the invitation to talk to all of you today. Um, and very much looking forward to uh, not just sharing uh, what we're learning at Michael Smith, but also welcoming a conversation. Uh, so I'm not, I'm sure Aslam had a, a much more illustrious introduction, so I'm a little bit more modest than that. I'm going to just point you to my biography on the web on the Michael Smith site. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about myself. So um, again, my name is Chinetta Jones. My pronouns are she and her, and I live and work in Vancouver on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. By way of background, I am American. Uh, my father's family descended from African slaves who lived, worked, freed, and eventually acquired the ancestral territory of the Chato peoples. My mother's family is of South Korean ancestry. And so I identify as African American and Asian and my lived experience is as a black woman. Um, I'm sharing all of this with you because in part, some of the things I will say today will be informed by my own personal lived experience, um, but also um, my experience of working internationally. So I trained as a scientist in the US seems like a long time ago now, uh, a couple of decades ago, my interests were actually in developmental neurobiology. And uh, over the last decade and a half, I've actually been working in research funding and research policy, first in the UK um, with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and then with the Wellcome Trust in London. And then most recently I moved to Vancouver. I moved literally a, a year ago, I think I'll be celebrating my one year uh, anniversary in another week's time in April. And so that uh, might tell you that I came at a really interesting time. I started a new job in a new country um, at a time that was unprecedented for all of us and really ended up just diving into work and having to really get to acquainted with a, a new context. I'd never been to Canada. I'd never worked in Canada before. And so I was learning all of this on the ground, so to speak, over the last year um, as we're trying to do a lot um, within the organization. So it's been an amazing experience, but I have to admit, I haven't seen very much of uh, British Columbia and I'm looking forward to when things open up. Um, so uh, I joined Michael Smith a year ago, but much of what I'm gonna share with you today is our experience of really supporting uh, COVID, um, the response, the research response, and, 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 and continuing to support the amazing talent um, that, here, that exists here in British Columbia. So I have a presentation, I'm gonna share that with you now. And then I'm, it's gonna be about maybe 20 minutes long or so. And then I'm going to invite um, any questions. I'm also gonna turn off my camera because I have two screens and seeing all of you and trying to coordinate is a little distracting for me. So if you'll just bear with me, I'll, I'll share my presentation. And um, I've already asked Sean to shout because um, I won't be able to see anything. So if there's uh, any issues or concerns or if you're having difficulty understanding or hearing me, please do let us know. So just bear with me a moment. Okay, so this year marks the 20 year anniversary of the Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research. We are British Columbia's health research funding agency. Founded after Nobel laureate, Dr. Michael Smith, we've, um, who has held a long life, um, lifelong, excuse me, commitment to supporting research talent. And we continue to build on his legacy and 20 years of achievements. We support research talent whose research will improve the health of all British Columbians. And we continue our long-term investments in building health research capacity in BC. Much of our work is about advancing health system research priorities and furthering the use of research evidence in policy and in practice. 
At the start of last year, we launched a new strategic plan called Delivering for BC in a Changing Environment. And core to this plan was a continued focus on research talent and research capacity. But little did we know at the time that we would have to rethink what this looks like in a rapidly changing and uncertain research environment. So when the pandemic was first declared a public health emergency, we like many other research funders um, really responded very quickly to try to offer support in the way of research evidence that would inform the public health response. We stood up a strategic research advisory committee that would advise on BC's COVID-19 research priorities and to support a coordinated and provincial COVID research response. We initiated rapid research projects deemed a priority by the provincial health officer and we funded further research projects, some in partnership with federal research funders and where we co-sponsored projects that addressed BC's research priorities. So while we responded to the acute short-term needs, we were equally aware that there will be long-term impacts that would arise because of the pandemic. So we reached out to research leaders, the research community, and our partners to understand the impact of COVID on health research in BC. So what I'm gonna share with you today is some of the insight and the information that we gained. And at the point of time that we did this was at the end of last summer. So while some of the information may be somewhat outdated, I believe most of it is still current and relevant. And what we learned was that 80% of BC's health researchers experienced a negative impact on their ability to do research. 45% said that their research actually had to stop 60% saw a significant increase in their workload, and 50% were balancing work with caregiving responsibilities. So I'm gonna delve a little bit more into what we heard, um, specifically looking at health research talent. We heard that caregivers are struggling to be as productive as their colleagues. Women are disproportionately affected by the loss of childcare resources and are struggling to balance home responsibilities with research responsibilities. This quote from an early career researcher was one of many that were very um, familiar to us as well as um, uh, shared with us. So it was a very um, good example of what we heard. Women, parents, both are taxed with extraordinarily high caregiving responsibilities right now that make it impossible to maintain the usual 40 plus hour work week. We're drowning. We're exhausted, we're burnt out, and we are fully aware that there is a childless colleague who just submitted three papers in a month, who is going up for the same award we are and feeling like he worked hard and deserves the accolades. If I think too long about it, I feel incredibly depressed. There was broad consensus um, from what we heard that early career researchers were among the most vulnerable groups. Early career researchers who are pre-tenure or new faculty were disproportionately affected by the halting of research activities and delays in grant competitions and were struggling to build or maintain their research groups. We know that early career researchers are in critical stage of their careers as they build up their research programs. Disruptions could cause significant setbacks, affect their productivity and their prospects for securing funding in the future. The senior uni university research leader shares their concern. COVID-19 and the curtailment of research is causing massive disruption to more junior faculty, pre-tenure crowd, and grant tenure folks who are reliant on maintaining their salary and productivity. We found that disruptions to research varied by region or research pillar. Lab closures and limited access to clinical populations or communities impacted some researchers more than others. The senior researcher says the situation of junior Northern researchers in health services is particularly precarious. The halting of this research will not only negatively affect individual careers, but will also slow the production of the rich knowledge that can come out of research approaches, such as in-person interviews, shadowing or participant observation. Qualitative research that seeks to get at the meanings of things may be replaced by more surface level research. The pandemic undoubtedly impacted research across all career stages, but the greatest impacts were reported by postdocs and early and mid-career researchers who expressed serious concerns about their career progression. 
54% of early career researchers and 55% of mid-career researchers reported that their research had to stop. And only a small proportion of researchers and about 14% reported that they were able to take advantage of new COVID-19 research funding and shift their research to focus on COVID. We found that the precarity of work was linked to career stage and work status. The majority of senior researchers were in permanent positions and reported less impact on workload and scholarly productivity relative to the other career stages. Job stability decreased with early and mid-career researchers who not only reported increased workload, often due to teaching responsibilities, but a negative impact on their ability to carry out scholarly activities like writing and submitting publications. It's no surprise that graduate students, postdocs, and research associates are in the most precarious work uh, situations and reported reduced hours and job loss. So what did we learn about the impact of the pandemic on health research capacity in BC? As we know, research was curtailed, followed by a phased restart of in-person research activities. Um, at the time that we did this um, study, we heard that in-person resumption was at about 30% usual capacity. Um, we don't have current numbers, but I imagine it's not too far off from that right now. We heard major disruptions to clinical and lab-based research and clinical research capacity was stretched in most regions of BC, either because of new COVID related research studies or by clinical staff being deployed to provide clinical care. On a more positive note, there were new opportunities for pandemic related research and funding. But as I mentioned earlier, only a small proportion of researchers reported that they could take up these new opportunities. The majority of researchers, particularly biomedical researchers, reported a range of workforce challenges from hiring staff to attracting new students to interruptions and in training. More than half of students and postdocs reported the pandemic has greatly impacted their training and reduce their ability to network and collaborate with other researchers and research users. While the majority of researchers plan to stay in BC in the near term, early career researchers and research associates reported that they expected their careers or their plans to change. And this is of particular concern to Michael Smith as our mandate is to attract and retain research talent for BC. Impacts to the workforce and the loss of local knowledge and expertise could have a profound impact on BC's future, particularly loss of focus on province-led priorities and the health of people and communities in BC. With early career researchers constrained from doing the innovative and groundbreaking research needed, there could be a cost to the health of people and communities in BC long-term. The senior university research leader says, my real worry is losing people from academia who can't get back on track and losing knowledge there's so much to learn and so many health challenges that we have dropped the ball on. Another threat to the loss of the workforce is the loss of productivity, which could make it challenging for researchers to stay in research in a highly competitive research environment. This postdoc fellow says that universities are taking significant and important measures to ensure the slowing of COVID-19, but that also means it is significantly harder to accomplish the same amount of productivity especially as a junior postdoc with experimental plans that rely heavily on being on campus and collaborating with others. 60% of early career researchers and 72% of mid-career researchers and 46% of senior career researchers all reported that knowledge translation activities were disrupted. The most commonly reported impacts were dissemination activities and difficulty collaborating with research user partners. We found that the research pillar mattered, given that areas of research will likely influence the knowledge translation activities researchers undertake and ways in which they were disrupted. This senior university research leader says that a lot of KT activity can be done on virtual platforms, but there's nothing like that physical being there, being able to just see the visual feedback. Over a short period of time, using virtual technologies can maintain momentum and keep the glue together on teams. But long-term, if it gets past six months, it's going to be a lot more challenging. So as a research funder, as we took in all of this information, we also inquired what support is already available to researchers and is it enough? 
That is with the limited resources that we have at Michael Smith, how can we really usefully help? There has been a range of federal, provincial, and institutional support available for researchers over the course of the pandemic. While early, mid, and senior career researchers were able to access supports, less than half of students, postdocs, and research associates could directly access report, uh, supports. Available supports were less helpful for those facing challenges due to personal circumstances, caregiving responsibilities, and strained finances. And there remained concerns that the federal funding was inadequate to make up for all of the lost research time and operating costs in the longer term. This quote by a senior university research leader exemplifies these concerns. Extending the tenure clock by one year would not ameliorate inequities between more vulnerable subgroups of early career researchers. Those who can work remotely, for example, are better off than those who need to work on campus to, to access specialized facilities or who are doing human participant research. Early career researchers with childcare responsibilities who are primarily women are less able to make use of the extra time to publish and apply for grants. So at Michael Smith, we've taken a lot of this on board, um, this advice um, that we invited from the researchers that we spoke to, which fell into really three categories, funding, greater flexibility, and clearer communication. We've given no costed award extensions and we've given flexibility in the use of unspent funds uh, like travel budgets and registration fees for conferences that were canceled. We provided continuity funding in the form of costed extensions for eligible postdocs and early career researchers. We've also made changes to our 2021 research competitions by extending eligibility windows, adapting our application and review processes to remove unintended barriers to funding, and we revised our application forms to invite applicants to explain how COVID has imp impacted their research plan, their productivity, and to share any other challenges that they are facing. We are currently developing guidelines and training for peer reviewers on how to take the COVID-19 impact statements into account to provide equitable and fair review of applications. In addition, we have given urgent funding to BC's health authorities who are experiencing strained research capacity, trying to accommodate both COVID and non-COVID research. And we have made adaptations to our funding reviews and processes to increase the regional diversity of our awards. And lastly, we're developing plans for a longer term initiative to strengthen regional health research capacity. Core to Michael Smith's work is equity, diversity, and inclusion. EDI benefits research in multiple ways, from the people who carry out research, to the people who will volunteer to participate in research, to the people whose lives are made better and healthier by research. There is a robust body of evidence, <clears throat> excuse me, that explain the benefits of EDI. From increased research collaboration and innovation to the increased impact of research. But equity, diversity, and inclusion are often used together and interchangeably, and there's a lack of understanding of what each means, how they are different in practice, and why each matter. Diversity is about the differences in the lived experience and perspectives of people, and not all are visible characteristics. They may include race, ethnicity, political belief, religion, physical disability, cognitive diversity, sex, gender identity, and expression. This is where most EDNI initiatives focus, counting diversity and setting targets, but they fail to realize the full benefits because they ignore the other two critical elements. Equity is about achieving parity in policy, process, and outcomes for underserved people and groups while accounting for diversity. It considers power, access, opportunities, treatment, and outcomes. And thirdly, inclusion is an active, intentional, thoughtful, continuous process to address inequities in power and privilege. The aim of inclusion is to build a safe and respectful environment that ensures welcoming spaces and opportunities for everyone. And belonging is the outcome where equity, diversity, and inclusion intersect and everyone truly feels that their voices are heard, their contributions are valued, and they are empowered to speak up when further change is needed. Focusing on only one or two of these elements is just not good enough 
to achieve a thriving research community or to achieve the greatest impact. Inequities in research have been longstanding and well-recognized issues. Inequities were present in research before the pandemic and the pandemic has only exacerbated these inequities. In 2016, Statistics Canada reported that while white women have representation that are nearing the general population levels at all career stages, attrition has led to significant and progressive loss of visible minorities in research at all career stages. Among the reasons for the lack of representation are systemic and structural inequities in research, and they are linked to an incentive and reward system that make it extremely difficult for ED&I initiatives to affect positive change. This includes institutional and systemic policies that disadvantage people by virtue of their identity, beliefs, or disability. But it's important to understand that this does not refer to individual people or their individual intentions or actions, but to an overarching system that by default benefits the dominant group and is upheld by an organizational culture or research culture or practices that perpetuate inequities. Many of you may be familiar with more traditional images of inequity where three individuals are innately different, for example, by height. And depending on their height, they each require different solutions to a problem, like a step stool or a ladder to look over a tall fence. These more traditional images of inequity <clears throat> imply that certain people of prescribed characteristics must receive some special treatment or solution to level the playing field. However, this view has been met with a lot of resistance by many people, particularly those that don't experience the same challenges. They presume that standards must be reduced to let other people in, or that some compromise has to be reached at the expense of others, or that different solutions for different people are inherently unfair. This negative framing undermines the purpose and benefit of equity-centered interventions. This negative framing perpetuates harmful beliefs about the concept of difference and asserts that meritocracy exists in the face of evidence to the contrary. This image by Nicolas Barcelo and collaborators present an alternative framing of inequity. It suggests that individuals are of equal stature, but each face different external forces or different lived experiences that distort how they appear. These external forces represent different structural barriers that must be addressed for true equity, diversity, and inclusion to be realized. Another challenge in achieving equity, diversity, inclusion is the concept of research excellence. Research excellence is a pervasive concept that is used generally to signify a standard of quality. It shows up in research in many ways and in the valuation of research for funding, publishing, hiring, promotion, or tenure. However, we all know that the definition of excellence differs markedly among academics, institutions, publishers, funders, and policymakers. Its meaning and use is so broad that there is no consensus and no standard definition or reliable measure. Rather, there's an over-reliance on the number of research outputs and publication metrics. It's highly subjective and creates room for bias. Its opaqueness by its very nature undermines trust. It underpins hyper-competition and importantly, it perpetuates inequities. Inclusive excellence states that true excellence in an institution is unattainable without inclusion. And in fact, equity, diversity, and inclusion are fundamental to excellence. Inclusive excellence supports equitable access to opportunity. It increases equitable and inclusive participation. It embeds ED&I in decisions, design, practice, and evaluation. So as I mentioned, ED&I is core to Michael Smith's work, but part of that effort is even looking inward at ourselves and understanding how our own work might be perpetuating unintended inequities, and importantly, how to improve our work to contribute to a more equitable, diverse, and inclusive health research system. So over the course of the next 12 months, we will conduct an ED&I and Indigenous cultural safety audits of our own programs and activities. We will continue collecting and analyzing ED&I data to identify where systemic inequities may exist in our own funding. 
We will collaborate with international funders to understand how research excellence shows up and is operationalized in research funding. And we will develop an equity-centered funding program for BC health researchers, those who have been disproportionately um, impacted by COVID, as well as those who've been facing challenges in research. Um, so I just want to thank you very much for your attention. And I'm um, happy to take any questions.